uh, to both. Uh, with that, uh, Vic, why, uh, let me introduce to our, our, let me make my introduction and then we will invite you to speak. Um, Vic is, Bar Barbiero is serving as the senior advisor to the Global Health Initiative here at the Wilson Center. He's a visiting professor at the Department of Global Health at George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services. Uh, prior to joining the School of Public Health uh, at George Washington, he was a foreign service officer with USAID for 21 years, working in East Africa, India, and Washington, uh, the divisions of child health, HIV AIDS, and population health and nutrition. Prior to joining USA, USAID, he worked at the National Institutes of Health in the Laboratory of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, where he conducted research on malaria and onchocerciasis. Is that, I really, thank you. <laughs> this is not my field. This is, this is and if you had any doubt, <laughs> if you had any doubts, I just confirmed that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was this Ancho? Ancho? River blindness? Yes. River blindness. I, I told him river blindness. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, I should read these notes in advance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> sure. He also worked on <laughs> he also worked on tropical disease uh, disease. Ep ep I, I, I always screw up this epidemiology in Sudan and with Michigan State University and, and with the World Health Organization in Burkina Faso. He was a Fulbright Scholar from 79 to 81 in Liberia and a Peace Corps volunteer um, many years ago in, in, in Ethiopia. He holds a doctorate in path, pathobiology and a master's of, in health sciences focusing on famine ecology from the John Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. Um, our discussant of David's presentation today will be David Oot. Victor's, uh, Victor's, I'm sorry, Victor's presentation will be uh, David Oot. Director of the Office of Health at Save the Children, where he oversees the provision of technical support and assistance to over 40 countries worldwide. His career in international health systems uh, spans some three decades, including 18 years of overseas experience in Asia and in Africa. Formerly also a Foreign Service Officer with USAID, where he served in Vietnam, Pakistan, Thailand, Kenya, and Nepal, and is Director of USAID's Global Bureau Office of Health and Nutrition. Um, he has his master's in public health from the University of Michigan. Delighted again to welcome you to the center. And Vic, would you like to sure. begin the presentation? Well, welcome, everybody. Um, it's so nice to see everyone here. And uh, as you know, we've been in phone contact. I see a lot of old friends and colleagues. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a pleasure to, uh, to be here today and finally get this meeting going. Um, let me figure out how to get this thing up and running. Um, I, I just want to take one second um, and, and also thank uh, Julie Doherty, who really worked so hard to organize the meeting and to get us all here and sending emails and doing edits on things. And she just did a yeoman's job, so thank you. And of course, and of course, Gib Clark, who we su supported us throughout, as as you all know, uh, in, in his leadership and, and interest in this. And uh, and also, I have to thank Tim Goodman, who from Pfizer, who worked with us very closely and really opened the field uh, to really make the meeting as practical and not a, not talking head. So I'm going to sky through my presentation because I want to get at some of the issues that uh, that are so in, so important here. Um, now let me. Is this? Ah. Basically, I owe my career to Africa, and it's part of the reason why I, I wanted to do this. Uh, I started off, as Howard said, as a Peace Corps volunteer, and I actually also, while I was teaching, I went over on a plane with 250 Peace Corps volunteers. 225 of us were teachers, and 25 of us were smallpox eradication volunteers. While I was at Peace Corps, 500 kilometers outside of Addis, I also did an intestinal helminth survey on my students and looked at variations between urban and rural kids in terms of warm burden. The problems I saw 30 years ago are still with us today. And those are one of the key, that's one of the key reasons that this meeting today is so important, to try to get the best thinkers we can 
to, ha to figure out how we're going to deal with these issues down the road. So in, in addition to being cradle of mankind, it's probably cradle of Vic Barbiero to some extent. Um, 47 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, a cultural diversity, as we say, 1,500 languages, um, 24,000 square kilometers, seaports abound. There's a political and strategic importance to Africa. Um, and there are great opportunities, and we can't forget that, the kinds of opportunities that exist there, the optimism that we have to maintain. It's not a continent without hope. There are solutions. The trick is to find those practical solutions. And there still is a very strong potential for business, for uh, resource development, and for overall development of the people and systems. How we get at those problems is what the, this meeting's about today. Regrettably, war, famine, disease, and death still are with Africa. If we look at this, as you'll see in the data, those problems are exacerbated on the continent. They haven't changed much in many, many years. Anybody who's been to the continent knows if you go out to the rural areas, a lot hasn't changed in terms of uh, the problems that exist, the problems of moms and kids. So dealing with these gigantic issues um, are, is, what, is what, what, what the job really is. Per capita income, Africa remains among the highest, as we all know, looking at U.S. dollars ranging from, this is, ah, ranging from uh, less than $100 in Burundi to uh, about $100 in Sierra Leone, still the lowest in the world. How we deal with that, how the governments themselves make those changes, reallocate resources over time is key. Life expectancy in Africa, What's, it, oops, what's, inter what's interesting here, probably because of HIV, it hasn't really changed in 30 years. 65% greater life expectancy in industrialized countries. So the overall burden of infectious diseases in Africa, layered HIV on top of that as, an infectious, as, one of the, as the major infectious disease, is a gigantic challenge again. This slide basically talks about fertility, and if you look at oops, if you look at fertility rates here, you're talking about a decrease, yes, but still fertility rates in general in sub-Saharan Africa of 5.4 children per per women per lifetime. Now that translates into growth rates between two and three percent, and bear in mind a three percent growth rate is a doubling time of about 20 years, 23 years, something like that. So. That's a huge demographic <coughs> issue that we have to keep in mind. Literacy is another key issue. Clear indicators, as we all know, literacy related to better health outcomes. How we manage that, how the governments manage that in the future is of grave concern. And this particular issue, as we all know, the ratio of male to female in terms of literacy is key. The girls are not being educated. And that, in, that enacts a cascade of events that contribute to maternal mortality and childhood mortality. <clears throat> Africa's burden of disease in terms of under five mortality is clear. Just, oops, just look at those rates in Africa. 90% of global mortality, under five mortalities in 42 countries, half in just six, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Congo are among the highest contributors. You can just see Africa's mortality, Sub-Saharan Africa's mortality relative to other regions of the world, about 168 per thousand. This hasn't changed much. It's decreased somewhat, but still it's a gigantic figure. Look at the highest rates in terms of worldwide, from Sierra Leone down to Chad. You're looking at rates of child mortality in certain countries above 250. Maternal mortality. Urban-rural differentials are clear. If we look at maternal mortality and under five mortality, clearly rural areas are at higher risk, upwards of 1,500 per 100,000 in terms of maternal mortality Africa-wide. This is a huge issue and places a gigantic burden on, obviously, the moms, girls, 
and children and families. And it's an impediment to overall development. Can't talk about Africa without talking about HIV AIDS. Of the 40 or so million people infected worldwide, 25 million live on the African continent. About 14 million are women. There are 2.7 million new infections in Africa a year of an average of 4.1 million worldwide, 66% of the world's population. Two million deaths from HIV in Africa in, in, Africa in 2005, about 71%. And Africa only has, Sub-Saharan Africa only has 12% of the world's population. So that burden itself is something that we have to look at. But we also have to balance the interventions of HIV with the systems that exist and the idea of overwhelming those systems with HIV prevention, care, and treatment and neglecting the rest of the mortality that goes on, that 10 million plus children that die each year and moms is, is, is something that I think we all have to struggle with given the fluctuations and hydraulics of international assistance as well as time and materials and effort by governments themselves. Tuberculosis, when I served in India, certainly India and China have huge numbers of people infected and represent the highest numbers of deaths. But if you look at incidents per percent infected and dying per, pop per 100,000 population, mm -hmm. Africa is the highest. Now clearly we know that's linked to HIV but that doesn't make the problem go away. And how we balance that with interventions, vertical, quasi-vertical interventions with HIV, quasi-vertical interventions for TB and other diseases, and then looking at those health system deficiencies that we all know about, those are the kinds of challenges, again, that we need to look at. Malaria, a major burden of disease and mortality from malaria exists in Africa. It's declined somewhat but we've seen a resurgence since the 70s. Resistant strains, poor systems, we have good interventions. How we apply those interventions of nets, integrated control, uh, presumptive therapy for moms, and, uh, and, and, and accurate diagnosis and treatment, we can do. How we bring it down to the field level and to the community level um, are, are what we have to struggle with today. Regretfully, as a number of you in the room, including, including Ulf, know, Africa is in turmoil to a great extent in terms of conflict. Some of the stuff that I've looked at, 23 conflicts over the last 20 years. Uh, places like Rwanda, Burundi, looking at what's happening in Darfur today. How we manage those conflicts, how we deal with undernutrition related to those conflicts, food shortages, famines, uh, refugees, and internally displaced populations all put pressure on the systems that we're looking at. And it's not, there are no easy answers to this. These are, this is governance, this is politics, this is uh, resource issues that, that internally have to be addressed over the long term. In terms of transitions, uh, my paper deals with these kinds of trends. When you look at a demographic transition, basically you're looking at decreased birth rates, decreased death rates, but what we also have, oops, but what we also have is a population momentum that increases over time before it levels off. And what we're going to see in Africa is, as you'll see later, a change of shift of populations on where they are, where the major growth is. It's going to be in urban, peri-urban areas. And that's going to be a, a tremendously important recognition for municipalities to deal with, as well as governments and as well as, uh, as, well as the international community. Thought a little bit about deal breakers. You've got 725 million people today approximately in sub-Saharan Africa. About 43 percent are under the age of 15. By 2030, Africa is going to have about 1.4 billion people. 1.4 billion. 40 to 50 percent of them live on less than a dollar a day. And just to bring things home, in a, in a city or a greater, greater Lagos, if you look at Greater Lagos by 2015, it's going to have 23 million people. And given a growth rate of about 3%, 3.6%, you're doubling times about 20 years. So by 2035, 
Greater Lagos could have 43 million. The economic, social, and political and health consequences of that, ramifications of that, are something we have to acknowledge today in order to try to change. When you look at demographic shifts, this is Kenya, these are projections, you're going to see greater people in older age groups. How these, this is 2050 for Kenya, this is today, how these age groups survive and how the care for those age groups is manifested is going to be a challenge because that's where you're going to see your shift from infectious to chronic diseases. And these diseases are more expensive to deal with. And clearly, the public-private sector balance related to this shift is going to be an important issue in the future. Just tagging on to that, the epidemiologic transition, we all know much about this. We're basically starting to see a shift from infectious to chronic diseases. And I think there are some lessons, maybe we'll have time to discuss it today, some lessons in terms of HIV AIDS, because HIV AIDS, albeit an infectious disease, HIV AIDS in terms of its management is chronic in nature. And how we look at that management is going to be key in the future to managing other chronic diseases from a systems standpoint. Africa is not quite there yet in terms of the burden of disease. Um, uh, but if you look worldwide, you're starting to see in high, oops, in high income versus low income and middle income countries, some of these chronic diseases are beginning to emerge as major causes of death. Africa, the major causes are AIDS, malaria, lower respiratory, diarrheal, perinatal conditions, measles, what we call the unfinished agenda, and then get into some of the more chronic diseases. This is going to change in the next 25 years, guaranteed. Guaranteed. And we have to acknowledge this. Governments have to acknowledge this. Africa has to acknowledge this and see how we can deal with it. Clearly, we have to address the unfinished agenda, those deaths of moms and kids. We know what the causes are. and We also know what the interventions are. The key is how do we deliver those services? What are, we have to keep, I keep asking myself, and we have to keep asking ourselves, what are those barriers? Is it money? Is it communication? Is it information? Is it systems? Is it logistics? Is it corruption? Is it care? We know what the problems are. We don't search ourselves enough to figure out why and try to de de derive appropriate solutions. And when I say we, it's almost a misnomer because it's Africa itself that really has to do this. I've been in this business for 25, 25 years and it's, I still face the same sorts of struggle in my own mind with this sort of issue. Layer on top of the unfinished agenda, preparation for the future transitions that are inevitable. They are inevitable. When are we going to think about it? Oh, when the horse is already out of the barn? One thing I do know, as it was alluded to before, public and private sector partnerships are part of this solution, that governments cannot do it alone. How we realize those partnerships, those effective partnerships, is key. Just a little bit on urban and rural. Urban populations are better off usually than rural populations, but if you break it down to quintile analysis, as David knows quite well in certain respects, you're looking at, this is, oh, these are old data, but you still see some of this holding. In terms of infant mortality, you have higher rates of death in the poorest of the poor in urban centers. I think as urban centers grow, these sorts of data are going to become more clear. Where is that growth occurring? You can see this slide, a lot in sub-Saharan Africa. 95%, more than 95% of the world's growth is going to be in the developing world, and probably 60 to 70% of that growth is going to be in urban areas. Huge statistic. Africa by 2030 will be 54% urban. We can take some lessons from Africa today. Look at a place like Zambia which is probably between 46 and 48% urban already. How are we dealing with problems there? 
How's the HIV AIDS epidemic affecting health service delivery? What's child and maternal mortality look like? I call it a crucible. By definition, a crucible is something where you put a number of different compounds in and you heat it up real high and you get something a little bit different. Generally speaking, you have an urban crucible where you're going to have this collision of environmental factors, of social factors, of infectious disease, and chronic diseases all coming together in the urban environment. How we manage and plan for that, and how governments plan for that inevitability is key. In terms of major African cities, this is within, these are data that show city limits. Lagos, 8.9 million. Kinshasa, 7.8. And I'm not even sure if these data in, include all the slum areas that exist. Sometimes they're just estimates. Sometimes the data aren't as solid to get. But I know when I was a volunteer in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa had about 500,000 people. When we went back in 92, estimates were at that Addis was between 2 and 4 million. Nobody really knew. That's a four-fold to eight-fold increase. And that's not intrinsic <laughs> rates of growth. That's migration in, people coming in looking for jobs. How, that, how those municipalities <laughs> deal with that is something we need to put on the table here today. But there are opportunities, I think. There are resources that exist. Certainly urban environments are politically sensitive. I think there's options for easier reach and access for a lot of populations in the urban environment. There are options for public-private sector partnerships, not only private care from physicians, but also from the non-government community. And how these are explored in a trustful and effective manner are important. I just throw this up, Africa isn't there yet, but there are some indications in some of the capital cities of Africa that you're starting to see rates of malnutrition, but not undernutrition, overnutrition. And I think this is just a, a trend that we may want to look at people who have been and have traveled even to rural areas know that you see pre-processed foods, Coca-Cola, um, uh, a fall in cereal intake is certainly in the higher socioeconomic strata, more alcohol consumption and sugar added to food in a lot of your uh, smaller towns and cities across the continent. Systems. To me, it's the heart of the issue at all levels, but particularly, I think, these lower levels. How do we get to those? What are the points of intervention? Where is the most access? Where is the deficiency of access? And how do we get those services strengthened? That's a gigantic question. We're not going to solve it today, but I think the experience from this group can put some points on the table. Uh, hopefully it won't depress our, all of us too much in terms of the challenges that exist here. But these are real issues in terms of getting at these levels, and maybe when Dan talks, some of the models that, that he's seen. In terms of elements, we kind of know this, management, staff, keeping staff, capacity building is important, but making sure we have the right people in the right jobs and keeping those people at those posts is what's very important as well. Organizational structure as well as financial and economic support to those systems, not only in terms of salaries, but in terms of uh, equipment and supplies and mobility to some extent. That's how service delivery is improved and we all know the deficiencies that exist in Africa today relative to this issue. I heard Jeff Sachs talk uh, last Thursday and um, I love Jeff Sachs. I don't agree with him all the time in terms of the stuff that he that he puts, puts forth but um, he talks about you know if everybody in America gave one Starbucks coffee you could basically raise about a billion dollars and that would service a third of the malaria needs worldwide. Well, that's an interesting figure. It's kind of something that we can all relate to, um, but uh, it's certainly not as easy as it sounds. And, uh, and I think this is another important concept, at least from my thinking, that money is not the answer to everything. That money is there, but it's not the answer to everything. And we need to figure out how we can get more resources, certainly for in a sustainable manner, how governments themselves can dedicate more resources to this, uh, to these problems. 
but make the money work better and make the money sustainable. But Sachs said something interesting the other day in terms of deal breakers. He talked about financing as one, but he also talked about planning, accountability, and responsibility at the lower levels of the system, and then the concept of monitoring and evaluation to track where you are, where you've been, and where you're going. And those sorts of evaluatory concepts and channeling information up and down the system I think are important in terms of uh, success, lasting success in the future. As I said, clearly public-private sector partnerships are keys and part of the solution. And I just thought about this a little bit. We, oops, we know what public-private sector partnerships are. I thought another PPP thing would be a product prevalence and a program. You've got to have an intervention. You've got to have something that works. Right now, drugs are some of the things that works, but we have to go beyond that. And it has to be a key issue. The diseases that we're dealing with have to be prevalent. We certainly have that in Africa in terms of maternal and child health and the unfinished agenda. Then the question is, what's the program? What are you really going to do, and how are you going to deliver those services? I think that's part of the challenge. Secondly, PPP squared, and, and Bob alluded to that earlier, the idea of not only having a public-private sector partnership with one private sector partner, but grouping some of the majors together and contributing certain niches or certain, not just money, but certain, uh, certain either commodities or, uh, or, or working in areas where people are, or big companies are both working, how we deal with the pharmaceutical and the, and the pharmacy network in these countries. So linking up vast private sector entities together from the NGO community, the for-profit community, all striving for the same objectives in a specific place. Not a quasi-vertical program, but a system strengthening approach. I think that's one of the things that, that could be quite exciting. And the last one, PPP squared, that I thought about is that you have to have people you have to have a promotion of an idea that people have to understand that, that this is an important concept of health. That's not too difficult to understand because a lot of people who are sick know they're sick and know that health is a good thing. You have to have permission or engagement from the communities that you're dealing with. And it has to be seen as a priority for communities and governments. We can't just say it's a continent without hope. We have to have an action-oriented <laughs> approach on every agenda that exists in the industrialized and developed world. This is a slide I saw last week that Peter Hotez from GW put up in terms of the neglected disease uh, uh, conference that was going on. There's a gigantic amount of intervention here in terms of, as Bob said, Pfizer's engagement, Merck's engagement in, uh, in onchocerciasis, uh, GSK uh, for lymphatic filariasis, partnerships with Merck as well goes on, but these are specific entities. And it's wonderful how we cultivate these sorts of, this sort of energy, how we cultivate this sort of commitment to the broader scale of health service delivery on the continent is the real challenge in my mind. There are opportunities. There are opportunities. What can we learn from these partnerships? How can Africa expand these models? What's replicable? <laughs> And what's expansive within these models? And how do we get this, get, how, do we translate, how do we translate that into strengthening systems? And today we can talk about, are there other models that we can pursue? And models are great. We can write about them. We read about them in textbooks. But they're not going to be solid until we apply them at the field level. And that, I think, is an ultimate step of meetings like this, that we really have to acknowledge where we've been and see those successes. When you're talking about 120 million doses of azithromycin, that's pretty important. But how do we translate that into the system needs of this continent to address the present and emerging issues that we see, that we will see? During that same Day last Thursday, there was a presentation from the Onchocerciasis Control Pro uh, Program, and the presenter talked about these sorts of things. And I thought these were interesting elements to consider. Why is that OCP program working? Oops, they have an unlimited 
drug supply. Merck has pledged that. We know that. They have over 108 projects in the region. It's a region-wide approach. They have local NGOs as well as multiple donors, international NGOs, and a, international NGOs as well, and 117,000 communities involved. And this was the hook to me, that figuring out how you get down the system to engage communities in their own health and be part of the solution. We've tried it. It's worked in some places. But how do we expand that to scale, I think, is an important challenge that still that still remains. So a couple of conclu conclusionary thoughts. Clearly, Africa's got to find its own solutions. Perhaps a regional mandate for health is in order, not just for Nigeria or for Ethiopia or for South Africa or for Tanzania, but regional priorities that the uh, AU and others demand. The unfinished agenda clearly remains a priority, and we have to deal with that. Just look at the burdens of disease. System strengthening, but system strengthening linked to accountability and individual and system responsibility is essential. We have to have a plan, and clearly we do have to have financing. Public-private sector partnerships are a no-brainer. We know that that is the way we need to go in the future. How we realize them, how we implement and support them, from people like you sitting around the table and the governments themselves is where the challenge is. I firmly believe that points of no return do exist. When you're looking at some of these trends, you can get into almost untenable and unmanageable situations. And how we recognize those trends today and act on them today will mitigate the effects in the future. We can't ignore the inevitable. And for me, now is the time for action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vic. Uh, excellent. Uh, Dave? Thank you. Um, Victor, I think I should have seen your slide presentation before I pre prepared my comments. But, uh, um, and you also, I think when you first asked me to do this, said there, there really wouldn't be any work involved. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> First of all, I'd have to say, I, uh, yeah, right, I did go back and, and do a little homework, and there was, and actually it was useful, um, because it did remind me of many of the issues that I hadn't thought about as deeply and as broadly uh, in a number of years, and I'm, I'm glad I had the chance to do that. Um, secondly, I'd like to just thank Victor and others for organizing this event. I think it's really important that we come together and really wrestle with some of these important issues. And thirdly, to say that there are a number of old friends and some very old friends that I had not seen and uh, worked with a number of years ago in Kenya, like Dan Kaseji. Uh, so glad to be able to reconnect at this event. Um, when I read Victor's paper, um, the first thing I did was to initially feel overwhelmed because it's a pretty long litany of problems and things that uh, if not addressed are are going to make it extremely difficult to see the kinds of changes that we'd all like to see in, in Africa. Um, and I started thinking about are there with respect to the health sector some positive deviance out there? Um, this is a terminology that, or a term that we use in Save the Children to basically describe changes that take place of a positive nature in an environment where people are constrained. You have people are constrained in the same ways, but some people find a way to succeed, whether it's a mother caring for a newborn, or it's a community, or it's a country that's been able to deal with a set of issues successfully. And I'd have to say that uh, I, was, I had a hard time looking specifically at issues around under five 
um, health and survival, I had a hard time finding very many uh, positive deviants in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that was a little discouraging. Um, but it made me think also that it's important, I think, as we work in the health sector, while we would like to fix the wide range of things that are constraining our ability to be more effective, political instability, weaker corrupt governments, et cetera, that in many ways we have to view that as the context within which we're going to have to work uh, in many ways in order to be able to have an impact on some of the health issues that we care about. Um, so the good news is that while the overall picture is in many ways bleak, and particularly looking at the child health aspects of it, <laughs> if we look back historically, um, under five mortality rates, for example, have dropped by nearly 50% since 1960 in, I counted the 13, I think, out of the uh, 37 countries in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So there has been progress and there has been progress in some countries. Um, but uh, if you look at what's happened more recently, there has been virtually no change or in many cases uh, an increase in under five mortality in 14 out of those 37 countries since the early to mid 1990s. So uh, whatever progress was happening uh, we're finding a much, much more stagnant, either stagnant situation or a worsening situation. Clearly, some of that related to the impact of HIV AIDS, but even in countries that at this point are not seriously affected by HIV AIDS, uh, we're seeing some of those similar mm -hmm. trends. Um, so we now see ourselves in a situation where Sub-Saharan Africa represents roughly, as Victor alluded, uh, a little over 10% of the world's population under five and 40% of the world's under five mortality. So clearly this is where the problem that from a child health perspective we're seeking to address is concentrated. Um, at the same time, uh, I think on the good news side, uh, we can point at the next level to really successful program interventions. And when people think about that, they often think about vertical programs, and that clearly is what we had a number of years ago to deliver these interventions. But currently, many of those interventions are in fact being delivered within the context of an integrated health system. They may be getting more attention than other um, interventions within that health system, that, but in fact they are uh, being delivered by the same people who deliver a variety of other interventions. And just to give you, I think, uh, an example of some of those that where we, some of those interventions where we do have success to report. If you look at immunizations, for example, and DPT3 coverage, 15 out of 33 countries do have uh, equal to or greater than 80% coverage. Um, and that is not a small achievement. If one were to go back 20 or 30 years, you would find much, much lower uh, levels of coverage of that intervention. Uh, at the same time, measles, which of course had a big push as a result of the measles campaign, we see that 20 out of 33 countries have achieved at least 70% coverage of measles immunization. Uh, vitamin A coverage, another highly effective proven intervention uh, for addressing under five mortality, um, especially supplementation uh, delivered to children six to 59 months. 18 out of 33 countries have uh, reached a coverage level of 70% or more. Um, again, a, a remarkable achievement in the context of all of those constraints that Victor alluded to and the weak health systems that uh, exist in most countries where we work. Uh, breastfeeding recently, I think, is an interesting case in point. Um, 
This is considered, uh, for those of you who read the Lancet series on child survival, um, the most important preventive intervention, um, but one that in the minds of many people could not be and had not been successfully inter, uh, in implemented at scale, and, and what I'm talking about is the promotion of immediate and exclusive breastfeeding, with many people believing that the very deep-seated cultural practices in many countries where we work really mitigated against our ability to um, alter that behavior and that important life-saving behavior. But in a number of countries, we've seen very significant change. So in Ethiopia, for example, um, we've seen immediate breastfeeding increase from 43 to 77 percent. Exclusive breastfeeding through six months from 39 to 62 percent. Uh, Madagascar from 32 to 62 percent um, immediate uh, breastfeeding. Exclusive from 42 to 70 percent. So the point here is that even though we have uh, in general, an environment that looks discouraging. We can, in fact, identify um, reasons for being optimistic about what can be done and the impact that those programs can have. Um, another issue not alluded to uh, really in Victor's paper, but one that I think, you know, as we talk during the course of the day, that we do need to think about, and that is uh, the impact that a number of more focused and large-scale initiatives are having on the systems that are currently in place and supposed to be committed to delivering routine child and maternal health uh, services. And for those of you who are wondering, well, what on earth are we talking about here? Um, for example, PEPFAR and um, soon to come in a, in a more concentrated or focused way, probably the um, Malaria Initiative. Um, and a variety of other programs that, on the one hand, address what we know to be really critical issues, but for weak health systems can be overwhelming or at least can uh, really divert attention uh, away from what it takes to deliver routine health services in those countries. And, you know, we saw that impact, I mean, through the, uh, through the 90s, for example, not just related to this, but a variety of other issues. I mean, no change globally, for example, in immunization coverage. Um, the demographic transition, uh, it's absolutely true, it's going to happen. Uh, I would say we're at the, still the very early stages of stage three, that is a rapid decline in fertility. Um, and again, I went back and reviewed the numbers, and um, there are examples of sub-Saharan African countries where fertility has dropped dramatically. Um, Botswana, well, let's remember it's a country of a million people, um, and if you work in South Asia, as I do a lot of the time, that, that would be a kind of a medium-sized town increasingly in, uh, you know, <laughs> South Asia. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, uh, and of course countries like Namibia, South Africa, and Swaziland. But even in those countries where there's been a significant decline, the total fertility relates, rates remain high. I mean, we're still talking about, we're talking about going from a TFR of eight to five or 4.9 or maybe 3.7, but compared to much of the rest of the developing world, we have a long way to go. And I guess what I found really interesting, again, as I reviewed these numbers again, is that in many, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, there has been virtually no change over the last 20 years in total fertility rates. Um, and I think there's a, it's very important to try to understand. It isn't because investments haven't been made in those programs. I think it's very important to try to get a fuller understanding of what are the reasons for that lack of success. What, what, what's worked, what hasn't, and how can we do differently and better at it? And uh, just having spent 
five years in Kenya in the late 80s, early 90s, I, when I went to Kenya, the total fertility rate at that time was reported to be 8.1. It was supposedly the highest in the world. There had just been an article published in the, uh, by the Population Council by two very well-known demographers, do you remember this? Uh, basically saying the conditions in Kenya are such that there is no way that there will be in the foreseeable future any significant decline in fertility. And over roughly the next uh, seven to ten years, the most rapid decline in fertility ever recorded took place. Now, let's be clear, it went from 8.1 to uh, I think it was 5.3, so you're still talking about a high fertility rate, but the point is a systematic approach to understanding what were in fact the factors, both supply and demand related, that were resulting in very low levels of contraceptive use had not been addressed. And one of them was as basic, uh, Dan will remember this, was as, as basic as, both Dan's will remember this, as basic as, as finding out that uh, Contraceptive supplies are not routinely available in health facilities, I mean, for starters. So it wasn't rocket science. It was systematically trying to understand what were those constraints. Um, the second um, transition that Victor <laughs> referred to was the epidemiological transition. And again, I, I really didn't see yet, at least, in sub-Saharan Africa, much evidence that we're really getting very far into that. I mean, it's good to be thinking about the future, but when I reviewed the causes of adult mortality by country, only a few countries, uh, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, Namibia, uh, reported uh, chronic disease and representing more than 10% of all cause mortalities. Um, and if you then looked at um, uh, under five mortality, really those causes, with the exception, of course, of HIV AIDS and particularly those countries seriously affected by HIV AIDS, like Botswana, for example, uh, that really hadn't changed very much. It really hasn't. Um, and it's remarkable because it means that we need to be doing many of the things that we've needed to do for a couple of decades now. Um, the role of the private sector and private practitioners, I, I, I I think it's important for us to kind of unpack this issue because there are many different issues around the private sector and pri many different kinds of private practitioners and they tend to get lumped together. Um, you know, in South Asia they call some private practitioners are injectionists. So they go around and inject people with glucose when they're not feeling well. So there's that kind of practitioner on one end of the continuum and then uh, the private sector in Kenya, for example, through what was called the Christian Health Association of Kenya, I think they renamed it now the Church's Health Association of Kenya, you know, ran an extensive network of health facilities uh, that served a very significant portion of the population of the country. So it's really important, I think, to unpack that. I think if we're talking about private practitioners at the community level, uh, I think the, the record to date is really kind of mixed on how successful we have been in delivering or, or really working with those practitioners to deliver the kinds of interventions that are most needed and most appropriate in those settings. We certainly know that's where people go for care. There's no doubt about it. But changing uh, the practices of those practitioners I think remains a, a very significant challenge. And I think we need a more systematic effort to try to understand how whether and how we could engage those kinds of practitioners as real partners. And Dan, you've had a ton of experience trying to do that, I know. Um, you know, what we found in, in India, not Sub-Saharan Africa, was uh, among other things, even getting those practitioners to uh, participate in training programs because they're away from a practice that's in many cases very lu lucrative. Uh, the other is that prescribing cotrimoxazole, for example, to treat pneumonia <coughs> is a lot interesting than dispensing Cipro, which, uh, you know, means a lot more in the way of, of income for that practitioner. Um, so we do need to really, I think, investigate those, that role and the role, as Victor said, of, of how the public and private sectors can work together. And I, 
meant to mention as well, I think the same is true on urban health. Uh, I just don't think the models are there and it's a hugely neglected area and while there are many in urban areas who do have access to health care um, who can p afford to pay for it, uh, I mean, if you visited Mathari Valley in, you know, Nairobi, uh, you would find not much in the way of a health system and certainly in the public sector. And municip municipalities are, are uh, typically very weak, even weaker than ministries of health in delivering health services in those urban environments. Um, financing health care, that's a huge topic. Um, several of us worked on that together in Kenya, including Nancy uh, Apt certainly was very involved. Um, and you know, uh, it's, um, it's a tough one because we all know if you look at non-recurrent, uh, uh, I mean a recurrent non-salary um, budget and expenditures in most ministries of health, that's minuscule. And so your choices are, you know, you either find a way to increase the allocation of the Ministry of Health or you find a better way to make use of those resources that are there so that what was it, what percentage of the non-salary budget was going to a 2,000 bedded hospital in Nairobi, 60% roughly, um, so that you, you can make those allocations. At the end of the day, um, you know, more resources are needed. And so the question then becomes, is there a role or should there be a role for user fees? And I know that's a very sensitive, politically sensitive issue. Um, <clears throat> and one that I think uh, people form opinions about, at least as far as I'm concerned, without fully understanding the, the implications of, of what it means to abolish user fees if you haven't done anything to try to address the issue of non-salary recurrent costs at the same time. Uh, health manpower, enormously complex issue. Uh, I won't say much more about that except to say that I do think that beyond physicians and nurses and so forth, I think the idea that you're going to train physicians and nurses and deploy them to rural areas and expect them to remain there is a strategy that, that hasn't worked very well in very many places. What has worked well in a few places, and I, I'm thinking particularly about Nepal and Pakistan, two countries where I lived and worked, uh, is local recruitment. That is actually recruiting people from that locality, training them in that locality, and so they're not leaving a place that they're familiar with and that they know and that they're connected to. Uh, and I think there's, there's more that we could do in that regard. Um, I think on MDG4, for those of us uh, who were in New York uh, a couple of months ago, I think there's really a need to find a way to get political leadership much more engaged on this issue. It is, relatively speaking, easy to have a very nice conversation among health professionals about the importance of MDG4, but you do typically don't have political leaders and you don't have the finance ministry and others in the room engaging in that conversation, and I think there needs to be much more of that if we hope to move ahead. I, I didn't, you didn't mention it in your slides, Victor, but you did in your paper the issue about um, policies that are pro-rich, uh, I guess in my, my feeling is that they aren't intentionally or explicitly pro-rich, uh, but in, that is the, that's oftentimes the people who are better off are the ones who tend to benefit from many of the health programs that do get implemented. And so to me the challenge is not to make a shift from pro-rich, it is to be more strategic about how we reach out to those who are in the poorest 40% who don't have access to and use health services because we know they are not being reached in many cases through the programs that are being supported. So uh, in some, um, we've got lots of challenges, but I think in fact there are bright spots and I think there are ways to build on those bright spots. And I, I do think that we need to be successful. We need to build the political commitment, we need to make strategic choices about what we do and how we do it, and we need 
increased resources, absolutely. I, I'm a, you know, as Victor said, I think we all have, uh, we, we agree with much of what Jeff Sachs has to say. I don't think all additional resources are the complete solution to the problem in any countries to, uh, where we work, but when you've got per capita expenditures that are six or seven dollars, it's got to be part of the solution. And uh, the serious engagement, uh, as others have said, of the public and private sector working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I think that both Vic and Dave have done a marvelous job, at, as we had hoped, in sort of sketching out broad themes and um, 